I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with an amazing author by the name of Terry Stavridis. He has written a wonderful book. It is called Tales from the Last Days of Anatolia. He paints a vivid tableau of the waning moments of the Ottoman Empire through fictional short stories set in Asia Minor, today's modern Turkey. Though the characters are conjured from the realms of imagination, they navigate the complexities of very real events from that tumultuous era. We are delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team at Prime 7 Media for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and purchasing this wonderful book, Tales from the Last Days of Anatolia. Terry, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Uh, thank you, uh, Logan. Also, thank uh, Prime 7 Media for making it uh, possible. To, to oh, be with you. Our pleasure. Great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book and why you thought it was important to for readers to understand uh, the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, well, I actually come from originally from an academic uh, background. Mm -hmm. I've taught at uh, university and community college levels, both in Australia and the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, being a historian, I found over recent times that reading publics are not really interested in reading uh, academic histories. It's only those that have a special interest of the general public and, of course, ac academics who have an interest in reading history. So I, I decided to move away from academic history, not that I still don't write it. Mm -hmm. So I decided to dabble my hand in historical fiction. So I decided to put this vast knowledge of over 30 years of research and writing in uh, coming up with uh, fictional characters and that then trying to posit them in, in events that were taking place over 100 years ago and, and after, after, after the fall of the uh, of the Ottoman Empire in 1922. Mm -hmm. So that's the so, so that's the thing that, that that motivated me to do that. Well, I think it was a great idea because it does make the um, work very approachable to the average reader. Um, you don't have to be a scholar to read this. You'll be informed and you'll be entertained by the stories contained within this collection. Terry, let me ask you, which story in the collection resonated with you the most and why? Uh, all the stories do, but, uh, but, but the three ones where I've concentrated most of my uh, work on is uh, a lady from, from Pontos. So Pontos is, is a geographic region along the shores of the Black Sea. And this was a predominantly a Greek-speaking area. Of course, Turks, Armenians also lived in 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 that area as well. Now, now this lady, that Melina Panayotidis, uh, was married, had two children. She and her husband ran a small business, but they weren't wealthy, but but they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. The husband decides in 1920, during the time of the Greco-Turkish War, I want to go and fight. Uh, she, she tried to sort of maybe tried to dissuade him not to go, right. but he went and he lost his life. Mm. Like, like so many uh, soldiers lose their lives in conflict. Now, at, in September 1922, the Greek army was, was defeated and, and left Asia Minor forever. Now, the, the Greeks that remained behind were in the end, we're told to, to leave Turkey or, or either convert to Islam or die. Mm. So, so, so Melina was uh, was transported across the desert, mountains and all that, and she ended up in the southeastern coast of uh, Turkey. And um, so, so as part of the exchange of populations, she was then taken aboard an American ship made its way gradually across. They stopped in some of the Greek islands to uh, load up with food and take a bit of a rest of being on board the ship. But finally, she ends up in in Piraeus, 
and then uh, then she ends up in a her home was a tent near the uh, near the Acropolis, mm-hmm. like uh, and there are pictures that you see 1922, 23 of Greeks uh, from Asia Minor living in tents at the bottom of the of the Parthenon. Anyway, that that, that was her home for uh, for a couple of years. She managed to find an apartment. Uh, she became a seamstress. Uh, and she made her money. Then she set up her own business. Uh, she, her, her two children, Ioannis and uh, and Maria, were were her life. When when she was leaving uh, on on the road to be deported from Turkey, the only thing that kept her going was her prayers and faith in the Virgin Mary. Mm. And the will to survive, but because uh, I suppose if if I was trying to be now to try to be Molina, and I've got two children, my focus isn't so much on me. I need to survive to ensure that these kids are not orphans, and that's one of the tragedies of that period too. There were a lot of orphan children who never, you know, who lost their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and so on. And anyway, well, she lived through the tumultuous period of the 1930s in Greece, uh, you know, when the king came back, 1935, King George was reinstalled on the throne. Then a year later, you have a uh, a dictatorship under Metaxas, Greece in the Second World War. Her son goes and fights World War II. He, he becomes a lawyer. He, he goes on a trip to, to the United States in the 1950s. He loves it. He, he comes back and then he ends up living in Chicago. He, he becomes a lawyer. Yeah, the American dream as well, but yeah, because I'm fixated on the American dream as well. Yeah. And um, she she writes finally in her diary, I hope that one of my kids will actually take up the story and, and continue the diary entries, which I've kept. Yeah. So, so that's uh, that's the story of uh, of Melinda. There's a lot more to it, but but I'm trying to synthesize. The, the sort of key elements of, of her life. Now, the, the next guy is Harry Mulvaney. I could have uh, put in the real, not Harry Mulvaney, George Horton, who mm-hmm. actually was the American Consul General in, in Greece uh, at particular at the times, and also he was the Consul General uh, from 1919 until 1922 when the catastrophe happened in September of that year. So I, I came up with the fictional name, Harry Mulvaney. I changed the story around a little bit to, to, as you know, Hollywood does change events, you know, to make it a bit more interesting and all that. Yeah. So I gave the name of um, Harry Mulvaney. Uh, Harry Mulvaney uh, goes to the University of Chicago. He, um, he, he's, he, he, he graduates in the classics, and of course, you know he he must have learned Greek and Latin as well. And so the first job that he gets, he gets a job as a, as a journalist. Mm-hmm. And and he and he was interested in in socioeconomics events of, of the period in Chicago. He covered the mainly the poor people and all that. And and he also came across, he became fascinated with a very small Greek community. Uh, that was uh, in Chicago because in those days there were a lot of Greeks who came over in the 1880s, 1890s. They had their push carts and they sold their fruit and veggies and whatever to you know to actually make a living. Mm-hmm. So 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 he became very interested in that and he befriended one of these Greeks who spoke broken English and he was able to communicate with him in Greek as well. Finally, uh, he, he gets a letter from 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 the president of the day. Uh, and telling him, you are going to be our consul general in Athens. Mm. Because uh, basically uh, what the president would have been thinking was, we want a greater presence in, in Greece. And so, so so Harry ended up being a, a, a journalist, uh, so, sorry, sorry, uh, a diplomat. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, of course, he... He left the diplomatic corps for a short time. Then he became uh, an author, went, went on, on on a tour, you know, promoting his books and giving talks and so on. He came back again in, into the diplomatic corps and 
you know, he was stationed in uh, in Constantinople, which he really wasn't. He was really in Salonika. But he also gives a description of the social and economic life in uh, in uh, Salonika and, and so on. And, of course, he, he also describes he, uh, what was going on in... Um, in Asia Minor, in Greece, and so, so he had a very good knowledge of that. And when he was in Smyrna as well, he also learned French and Turkish, so he was very multilingual because uh, at that time, uh, Logan, uh, if you look at it uh, from the American uh, diplomats, very few of them actually spoke another language other than English. So so George Horton was that kind of guy. Now, uh, I remember somewhere in, the, uh, in his uh, biography, mm-hmm. um, he actually used to go up and uh, spend uh, spend some time with with King George the first of Greece they they'd mm. sit down and light up their cigars have their whiskey or brandy whatever they had and and they discuss the politics you know of, of their time uh now he also married a, a Greek lady uh so I suppose that's why he had this love of Greece as well mm. and uh when when Smyrna finally collapsed and the Greek army was ejected in September 1922, uh, he was very fortunate that his wife and daughter were in the US on vacation mm. uh, as such. Uh, after that, he, he he leaves a diplomatic corps and then he just pursues uh, as a private citizen after that. And that's what uh, George Horton actually did after that. He, the real George Horton actually ended up being a U.S. ambassador to, uh, to to Hungary in Budapest, and then after 1924, you know, George Horton was uh, disappeared uh, as such. But but he was one of the great American diplomats of, of his era. So Harry Mulvaney is really George Horton, uh, the the real George Horton. But I came up with a fictional character uh, because. I don't know. Sometimes I felt that maybe if I came up with George Horton and said things like that, you never know. There may be people that may take offence, and I right. don't know. Maybe do you? So, so that's why I, I changed the dynamics around a bit. Exactly, and it makes it historical fiction. It gives you a little freedom uh, in yes. storytelling to bring it to life with details you may or may not know about that may be inconsequential, but actually paint a picture of those days. And you've done a wonderful job. Folks at home, you can see that Terry is a master storyteller from some of the tales he has told us today. They're contained within a book called Tales from the Last Days of Anatolia. He paints a vivid picture of the waning moments of the Ottoman Empire through a series of short stories. Terry, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you very much, Logan, for for, for the opportunity to, to come onto your show. The pleasure is all mine. And of course, these books are available on Amazon and other booksellers as well. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time until next time on Spotlight.